thanks Nathan and thanks Petar, thanks everyone for organizing this and I'm really excited to be here. So, um, so I have kind of two titles for this paper. Uh, the first title is Where There's No No To Be Found, Negativity and the Unconscious. And the second title is Freud on Negation from Technique to Ontology. So I'm not sure, I've kind of been trying to figure out which, which one is best, so maybe you can let me know what you think after. So I'll begin with an epigraph um, from Heidegger's What is Metaphysics? It's the last line of the text. The fundamental question of metaphysics, he writes, is that the nothing itself, um, no, I'll start over, sorry. So the fundamental question of metaphysics that the nothing itself compels is why are there beings at all and why not far rather nothing? Freud's negation essay begins by offering negation as a seemingly simple technique for revealing unconscious ideas. Freud writes, negation, and the German title here you know is uh, Verneinung, is a way of taking cognizance of what is repressed. Because the content of a repressed image or idea can make its way into consciousness on condition that it is negated. For example, a quintessentially Freudian example, when a patient says, you ask who this person in the dream can be, it's not my mother. Freud amends this to, so it is his mother. Or an example applicable more broadly, when someone prefaces a remark by saying, I don't mean to offend you, you can be sure that the person with whom you are speaking, whether in analysis or at a party or over dinner, intends nothing less than to offend you. At first glance, there might seem to be some kind of disturbing implications for Freud's doctrine of negation in which no means yes. A kind of topsy-turvy logical scandal, as it were. Something not too unlike the opening lines of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, in which Alice declares that were she to have a world of her own, everything would be nonsense. Nothing would be what it is because everything would be what it isn't. And contrarywise, what is, it wouldn't be. And what it wouldn't be, it would. But unlike Alice, Freud's Wonderland does not simply substitute a no for a yes or claim that everything is what it isn't. Rather, Freud's curious observation is that every yes presupposes a no as its transcendental condition. It is for this reason, paradoxically, that every no is at least also a yes. Freud does not have to fantasize a world of nonsense to imagine the conditions under which no means yes, because in the world of the repressed, that is, in the realm of the unconscious, the no in itself is precisely absent. As Freud will say at the very end of the essay, we never discover a no in the unconscious. That is, in the world of the unconscious, any negation is at the same time a positive presentation. The transformation from no to yes in Freud's discourse then is not only the mechanism of a psychoanalytic technique, but it exposes the status of negativity as transcendental in what is as close as we get to a Freudian metaphysics. But before we get to this transcendental no and its metaphysical entanglements, let us take Freud's essay step by step. As I see it, there are five of them. So first step. Freud explains that the analyst can use the method of seizing upon the patient's negations in order to identify repressed thoughts and ideas according to the mode in which and the strength with which the thoughts and ideas are negated. Negation is a way of identifying what is repressed. Negation can also be, as Freud consistently claims, proof that certain interpretations offered by the analyst have hit upon repressed thoughts. For example, in the infamous Dora case 20 odd years prior to the negation essay, Dora's resounding negation in response to Freud's suggestion that she had been completely in love with her father, and also in love with Herke, was recounted by Freud with the following. My expectations were by no means disappointed when this explanation of mine was met by Dora with the most emphatic negative. The no uttered by a patient after a repressed thought has been presented to his conscious perception for the first time does no more than register the existence of a repression and its severity. It acts, as it were, as a gauge of the repression's strength. 
The technique of identifying repressed thoughts through negation offers not only proof of their place in the unconscious, negation is not only the hallmark of repression, a certificate of origin, as it were, like made in Germany, as Freud rather humorously puts it, but it also is a gauge. It's a measure of the repression's strength. The extent of the negation discloses the power of the repression. But these acts of disclosure, of identification and measurement alone, as we know from the earliest days of Freud's studies with Breuer, will not change the repression itself. Identifying the repressed idea and revealing it as a repressed idea to the patient will do little to undo the knot of the repression. In the course of the analytic situation, Freud explains that we often succeed in conquering the negation and in bringing about a full intellectual acceptance of the repressed. But the repressive process itself is not yet removed by this. The technique of negation is not adequate to the repression, although it does lighten its weight. Freud writes, negation is already a lifting of the repression, though not, of course, an acceptance of what is repressed. This line is central to the reading offered by Hippolyte in his commentary on Freud's essay that he delivered by invitation in Lacan's 1954 seminar on Freudian technique. In the German, Freud's line reads, Die Verneinung ist eine Art, das Verdrängte zur Kenntnis zu nehmen, eigentlich schon eine Aufhebung der, Verdräng der Verdrängung, aber freilich keine Annahme des Verdrängten. So the lifting of the repression, if you caught it, is um, in the original German, an Aufhebung. And Hippolyte points out that this is Hegel's dialectical word, which means simultaneously to deny, to suppress, and to conserve, and fundamentally to lift. In reality, it might be the Aufhebung of a stone or equally the cancellation of my subscription to a newspaper. The immense philosophical import of Freud's appropriation of this philosophical term of his use of Aufhebung, as Hippolyte sees it, it is this, it is this. Presenting one's being in the mode of not being it is truly what is at stake in this Aufhebung of the repression. But it is not an acceptance of that which is repressed. The person who is speaking says, this is what I am not. There would no longer be any repression here if repression signified unconsciousness, since it is conscious, but the crux of the repression persists in the form of unacceptance. So I'll say more about Hippolyte's reading of Freud's Aufhebung as we proceed in the following steps, but to remain at this first step for one moment longer, I want to turn to an example. We have established in this first step that what is essential to the repression remains even after the object of the negation has been intellectually accepted. This is obvious in the case of a third example that Freud uses in the negation essay. It is an example that is undertreated and ignored entirely by both Hippolyte and Lacan in their respective commentaries on the negation essay. And even Freud seems to pass it by somewhat quickly. But it is an important example, and it's perhaps the most important one, for it deals with the patient who is already initiated into the tricks of the analytic trade. So in all honesty, even if this isn't the most important example, it resonates with the dilemmas of any good neurotic reader of Freud. So I imagine that there might be some interested listeners here. So in any case, Freud writes, a neat counterpart to this technique of negation is often met with in an obsessional neurotic who has already been initiated into the meaning of his symptoms. I've got a new obsessive idea, he says, and it occurred to me at once that it might mean so and so. But no, that can't be true, or it couldn't have occurred to me. So what he's repudiating, Freud says, on the grounds picked up from his treatment is, um, is indeed the correct meaning of the obsessive idea. So this complicated transmutation whereby the yes becomes a no and then again a yes happens because the patient, this obsessional neurotic, as a diligent pupil of the psychoanalytic logic and as a new initiate into its truth, turns Freud's technique of negation into a kind of formulaic mantra, no means yes, yes means no, a vertigo-inducing mechanism whereby every thought is given over to reveal its opposite. 
The thought I just had about the meaning of my neurotic obsession can't be right because if it were really the cause of my neurosis, I would have no choice but to negate it. So we might illustrate this movement from yes to no to yes in the mutual reflections of two mirrors turned upon each other, producing an image of what Hegel would have called a bad infinity. Or more precisely, as he puts it in The Science of Logic, when something becomes an other, this other is itself somewhat. Therefore, it likewise becomes an other, and so on ad infinitum. This infinity is the bad or the negative infinity. It is only a negation of an infinite, but the finite rises again the same as ever and is never got rid of and absorbed. What has happened with the obsessional neurotic patient of Freud's is that he has mistaken the Freudian technique of negation for Alice's world of nonsense, and is ready to accept that each thought or idea is at least potentially its opposite. Ping-ponging back and forth between no and yes, the obsessive neurotic reader of Freud misses the point because the important part of the structure of negation is not at the level of intellectual acceptance. This brings us to the second step. While identifying repressed thoughts through the method of negation can bring about what Freud calls an intellectual acceptance of the repressed, this designation means that the acceptance is only intellectual. That is to say that it is not really a full acceptance. At this point, the repressed thought is still repressed, and the acceptance is just an intellectual one. To illustrate what this might mean in the case of the example with which we, we began, notifying the patient that his negation, that the figure in his dream is not his mother, actually signifies that the figure in the dream is at least related <coughs> to the idea of his mother, or else he wouldn't have brought her up in the first place. In response to this, the patient may well agree that this had been something that he hadn't recognized, but now he sees the dream figure in a new light, or at least he might concede following the terms offered by Hegel via Hippolyte of a negation of a negation, and he could formulate his discovery in this way. Well, the figure in the dream was not not my mother. We can see here how the double negation functions to provide an alternative between it is not my mother and it is my mother. The double negation provides a third way in which it neither is nor it isn't. It is, as Hippolyte says, an affirmation qua the negation of the negation. But this intellectual acceptance that can be understood as a negation of a negation remains only intellectual. The repression persists. But here Freud says something very troubling. He writes, we can see how in this the intellectual function is separated from the affective process. I can negate something and then intellectually accept the repressed content of this negation, but the repression is not for all of this changed. What is essential about the repression, that is to say, in keeping with Freud's language, what is affective about the repression remains. Negation, Freud seems to be saying, marks the border between intellect and affect. Now, this step is a difficult one because the language of affect is not so typical for Freud, and what's more, such a claim seemingly flies in the face of Freud's most often repeated claim that it is representations that are repressed and not affects. But nevertheless, he says it there quite distinctly. Man sieht, wie sich hier die intellektuelle Funktion vom affektiven Vorgang scheidet. One sees how the intellectual function separates from the affective process. So I'm still not sure what to make of this step. Marking a clear distinction between affect and intellect does seem at least out of character for Freud, and it may be possible to write it off as a heuristic gesture, a convenient foil for naming the remainder of what persists after the repression is intellectually accepted. But this heuristic would be in the service of avoiding the very thing that Freud has set out to name. What is it that endures of the repression after it is named, after it is represented in a negation. So Hippolyte deals with this difficulty by simply denying that Freud really intends to mark the separation as a real separation. He writes, even for Freud, there is no pure affect on the one hand entirely engaged in the real and pure intellect on the other which detaches itself from it in order to grasp it anew. On Hippolyte's reading, in order to carry out an analysis of the intellectual function, 
Freud does not show how the intellectual separates from the affective, but how the intellectual is that sort of suspension of content for which the somewhat barbaric term sublimation would not be inappropriate. Sublimation here marks the mutual genesis of both intellect and affect. As a good Hegelian, Hippolyte refuses Freud's attempt to neatly separate the affective from the intellectual, insisting instead not only on their inextricably intertwined dialectical relation, but on the status of their separation as itself mythical in character, rather than psychological. Right? So turning again to Hegel, Hippolyte says, at the end of one of Hegel's chapters, the point is to substitute true negativity for the appetite for destruction that takes hold of desire, and that is conceptualized there in a profoundly mythical rather than a psychological manner. To substitute an ideal negation for the appetite for destruction that takes hold of desire. So the split between affect and intellect is not a real split, but a mythical one, on par with the myth of master and slave, Hippolyte seems to suggest. Hippolyte repeats this recourse to myth throughout his commentary on Freud's text, so I'll be returning to this point in the following steps. But for now, let's mark the first myth he identifies in his commentary, the mythical distinction between affect and intellect. So in Lacan's response to Hippolyte's commentary, he agrees that Freud's use of the term affective should not mislead us into the traps of ego psychology or into the positivist assertions of what he calls the psychoanalytic New Deal. He, um, he, positions, um, he positions these discourses as, um, as missing, or, so these, these, these discourses, the psychoanalytic New Deal and, and positivist ego psychology, put pride of place on the affective life of the subject. Lacan's view on affect at this point is that the affective is not like a special density which would somehow escape an intellectual accounting it is not to be found in a region beyond symbol production, which supposedly precedes discursive formulation. In other words, affect is not something beyond thought, something that is somehow more real than thought. And we have to give up the notions and the notorious notions of an opposition between the intellectual and the affective, as if the affective were a sort of coloration, a kind of ineffable quality which must be sought out in itself independently of the eviscerated skin, which the purely intellectual realization of the subject's relationship would consist in. So although intellectualization on the analysand's part can sometimes serve the purpose of defense and resistance, the intellect is nevertheless involved in the all-important symbolization of experience. The concern is that appeals to affect as an explanation of what Freud is up to in this text fundamentally distorts the strong claim Freud here lays to structure. Lacan says, what Freud designates here as the affective has nothing to do with the use made of this term by the backers of the new psychoanalysis. They use it as a psychological qualitas occulta in order to designate that lived experience whose subtle gold they claim. It's only rendered through the decanting of a high alchemy, yet their quest for it evokes little more than a sniffing that hardly seems promising when we see them panting before its most inane forms. In this text by Freud, the affective is conceived of as what preserves its effects right down to the discursive structuration on the basis of a primordial symbolization. This structuration is also called the intellectual. So, and this is the real crux, I think, of Lacan's interest in Freud's Fernandung essay that it exposes, as he says, how much more structuralist Freud's thought is than received ideas would have it. That this text casts Freud's thought into its structuralist form, positing negation as a primordial symbolization. And the myth that Hippolyte identifies in the split Freud forges between affect and intellect, understood as myth, allows negation to emerge in its structuralist sense, as he says. Negation is symbolicity rendered explicit. That's Hippolyte, and then Lacan takes it up again. So symbolicity rendered explicit. So I want to take a brief detour at this point um, into one of the clinical examples that Lacan uses in his response to Hippolyte's commentary. Um, and then we'll return to walking through Freud's text step by step. But Lacan reinforces Hippolyte's reading of Freud's text 
as one in which Freud identifies negation as symbolicity rendered explicit by elaborating two clinical examples, one of Freud's in the case of the Wolfman and one of uh, Ernst Chris, who is a contemporary of Lacan's, a part of the ego psychology troika. Lacan, uh, so, so I'm going to focus on the, on the second one. Maybe we can talk about the Wolfman example in the Q&A. But um, Lacan treats Ernst Chris's analysis of the man who accuses himself of plagiarism and whose favorite dish is fresh brains. So in this case, the patient, a career academic, was convinced that everything he had ever published was merely an embellished plagiarism. He is plagued by the belief that he is incapable of original ideas and so must steal them from others. One day, the patient comes into analysis with proof that he's nothing but a plagiarist, showing his analyst a copy of his soon-to-be-published essay and a book he found in the library published a few years earlier by a colleague of his with whom he frequently spoke. The patient insists that his article is merely a recapitulation of his colleague's superior piece. After reading both of the articles, Chris demonstrates to his patient that the colleague's work only supports the arguments in the patient's piece and that there's no plagiarism case to be made at all, only mutual support of arguments. And after delivering this interpretation and this verdict, Chris, Chris uh, writes up the, the case report by saying, as if declaring a sudden insight, the patient said, Every noon when I leave here before luncheon and before returning to my office, I walk through X Street, a well-known street for its small but attractive restaurants, and I look at the menus in the window. In one of the restaurants, I usually find my preferred dish, fresh brains. So Chris obviously takes this to be a confirmation of his interpretation and an example of a successful analysis. For Lacan, though, this anecdote is uh, illustrative only of what Chris misses by ignoring the work of the negative by failing to think the dialectic of analysis. Instead of an analyzing the patient's belief that he himself is nothing but a plagiarist, Chris attacks the subject's world in order to reshape it on the model of his own in the name of the analysis of defense. By reading the essays and correcting the patient's erroneous belief that he himself is a plagiarist, Chris merely engages at the level of the imaginary identification through a kind of reality testing on the behalf of the patient and correcting what Chris takes to be the patient's erroneous belief. So Lacan's objection to this strategy is that this is precisely the level on which the analyst should not engage. Once the patient comes to see the world as Chris sees it, it seems that Chris thinks that all will be well. But this suggestion, um, entails an internalization or an introjection of a part of the analyst's ego by the patient, an identification by the subject with the healthy part of the analyst's ego, let's say. We might call this the injection of a new dose of fresh brains. But Lacan suggests that Chris misses the essential aspect of the patient's assertion. I am not capable of original ideas. If Chris had been following Freud's advice in the technique of negation, Regarding, uh, regarding his role as analyst, he would have seen that the real demand being made by the patient was the recognition of his own original brilliance. So the line, I'm not capable of doing good work, everything I write is derivative, just glorified plagiarism, really means, why aren't you praising me for my genius? <laughs> What's more, uh, such an interpretation would have led to an investigation of the very notion of plagiarism at the heart of the patient's demand. Chris again exposes his blunder. Lacan writes, if there is at least one bias a psychoanalyst should have jettisoned thanks to psychoanalysis, it is that of intellectual property. That is, rather than normalizing analysis in which the patient was coached to see the world as the analyst sees it, the analyst should examine the patient's insistence that he is not capable of original ideas as a negation on the order on which Freud demands. In order to do this, though, the analyst would have to draw on the insight, uh, on, on, the on the negation insight, negation essays insight, um, to challenge the presupposition of original ideas in the first place. Such an insight may have sat uh, satiated the patient's craving for fresh brains. Lacan's point here is that by approaching the ego's resistance, now this is a quote from Lacan, 
by approaching the ego's resistance in the subject's defenses, and by asking his world to answer the questions that he himself should answer, one may elicit highly incongruous answers whose reality value in terms of the subject's drives is not the reality value that manages to get itself recognized in symptoms. So now, um, now let us return to Freud's text and to the step-by-step -step analysis where we left off. With the elaboration of the claim that negation is symbolicity rendered explicit, we arrive at the third step um, of five steps, remember, in Freud's essay. After identifying the basic technique of negation and delimiting its mechanism and function, Freud goes on to locate negation in its position, as he puts it, at the psychological origin of the function of intellectual judgment. That is, because negation can bring about the intellectual acceptance of a repressed idea, that was step one, which is an acceptance that remains only intellectual and therefore not whole, not, as Freud put it, also effective, that was step two, we can identify negation at the origin of the intellect as such, step three. So now, this extreme claim that negation is at the origin of judgment asserts the primacy of negation itself as the most basic judgment. Freud writes, since to affirm or negate the content of thoughts is the task of the function of intellectual judgment, what we have been saying has led us to the psychological origin of that function. To, neg to negate something in a judgment is, at bottom, to say, this is something which I prefer to repress. With the help of the symbol of negation, Freud writes, thinking frees itself from the restrictions of repression and enriches itself with the material that is indispensable for its proper functioning. The freedom Freud here identifies is a freedom to represent. Or more precisely, it is a freedom to represent the content of a repressed idea, even within the conditioning aspects of its repression. That is, without the freedom given by the symbol of negation, a repression would lead not just to a verbal negation of something, but to a kind of negative hallucination. Due to an ossification in the unconscious, it would lead to the kind of denial that is characteristic of the psychotic break with the real. Freud confirms this later on in the essay. He writes, the general pleasure in negation, the negativism displayed by many psychotics, is probably to be understood as a sign of a diffusion of drives that has taken place through a withdrawal of libidinal components. Negation is thus not only the quality of a judgment, it is the condition of its possibility. Not only a category of discourse, but its locus. The speaker has torn him or herself from what she or he is speaking of. And by speaking, the speaker continually holds it from afar as a symbol, symbolicity rendered explicit. So the structure of negation liberates thought from the imme immediacy of the real, cutting open a space that makes possible the relation between the signifier and what it signifies. As he did with the split between the affective and the symbolic, Hippolyte locates this moment, too, in which Freud identifies negation at the origin of the function of judgment in the realm of the mythical. He writes, at the outset, Freud seems to be saying, but at the outset means nothing more than in myth, once upon a time. In this story, once upon a time, there was an ego by which we should understand here a subject for whom nothing was as yet foreign. So this myth is the myth of a primary affirmation, a, a beyahun, that renders the fernainung possible. And why not? Why doesn't Freud say that the function of judgment is made possible by an original affirmation that can then be negated? Well, because negation has a role to play, not as a tendency towards destruction, Hippolyte says, nor within a form of judgment, but insofar as it is the fundamental attitude of symbolicity. Okay, so fourth step. At this point, Freud maintains a classical philosophical distinction in his discussion of judgment. There are two basic kinds of judgments, judgments of attribution and judgments of existence. He writes, the function of judgment is concerned in the main with two sorts of decisions. It affirms or disaffirms the position of a thing by a particular attribute, judgments of attribution, or it asserts or disputes that a presentation has an existence in reality, judgments of existence. So um, 
So in the case of judgments of attribution, expressed in the language of the oldest oral instinctual impulses, the judgment is, I should like to eat this or I should like to spit it out. And put more generally, I should like to take this into myself and keep that out. That is to say, it shall be inside me or it shall be outside me. The original pleasure ego wants to interject into itself everything that is good and to eject from itself everything that is bad. What is bad, what is alien to the ego, and what is external are, to begin with, identical, Freud says. And in the case of judgments of existence, we find a question of representation. So this will get us back um, to the way we were talking about negation in step three. So there is a presentation here that's related to reality testing. It is no longer a concern of the definitive reality ego, which develops out of the initial pleasure ego. Um, no, sorry, it is, it is now, now we're talking about the reality ego. So the mapping goes, goes like um, this. So pleasure ego is associated with judgments of attribution, this is good or bad, um, whereas the reality ego is associated with the judgments of existence. So um, it is now no longer a question of whether what has been perceived shall be taken into the ego or not, but of whether something which is in the ego as a presentation can be rediscovered in perception, or in reality as well. It is, we see, once more, a question of external and internal. What is unreal, merely a presentation and subjective, is only internal. But what is real is also there outside. In this stage of development, regard for the pleasure principle has been set aside, because experience has shown that it is not only important whether a thing, an object of satisfaction, possesses the good attribute and so deserves to be taken into the ego, but also whether it is there in the external world so that he can get hold of it whenever he needs it. So in order to understand this step forward, we must recollect that all presentations originate from perceptions and are repetitions of them. Thus, originally, the mere existence of a presentation was a guarantee of the reality of what was presented. To find negation in both of these kinds of judgments is to identify negation not only at an origin of intellect, at the origin of judgment, but also at the origin of perception. In this sense, before being a relation within the system, negativity informs every relation, be it of resemblance, even of identity, as long as the position of a relation in general presupposes the composition of terms. So now finally we've come to the fifth and final step of Freud's negation essay. This is the step where I think that the metaphysical entanglements of what I earlier called the transcendental no come to the fore, though I think that they've also been there all along. This step marks the explicit movement from technique to ontology. Freud writes, this view of negation fits in very well with the fact that in analysis we never find a no in the unconscious and that recognition of the unconscious on the part of the ego is expressed in a negative formula. So repeating the claim that Freud made in the Dora case, which we've gone through already, Freud goes on, there is no stronger evidence that, we can, uh, that we've been successful in our effort to uncover the unconscious than when a patient reacts to it with the words, I didn't think that, or I didn't ever think of that. At this point, we should elaborate a distinction, a distinction that has been at play, really, I think, in each of these steps, between negations within judgment and negations that establish the possibilities for judgment as such. We might think of the former as a kind of exclusion within a system of language that establishes discrete relations, while the latter is a transcendental mark of reference. When Freud explains that we never find a no in the unconscious, it is not this transcendental no, actually, but it, the merely discursive one. I think this is the only way to understand this Freudian assertion. The transcendental no opens up the possibility for the discursive no, but the discursive no itself is only marking a syntactic relation. And that's precisely the, the kind of no that can't be found in the unconscious. Hippolyte's reading of this last paragraph is offered only in a nutshell, an affirmation that the recognition of the unconscious by the ego demonstrates that the ego is always misrecognition. But the question with which I am left in Hippolyte's reading in his insistence on the mythical is this. I wonder, um, I wonder where, where Hippolyte identifies the aspects 
um, that are mythical throughout the reading of Freud's text. Couldn't we call these moments instead transcendental? As moments that are not empirically derived, granted, not genetic, for sure, yet as moments that are conditions of the possibility of the subject that hold the weight of necessity and universality. Don't we have here, in Freud's text on negation, the essential aspects of the constitution of transcendental arguments? These so-called mythical moments in the separation of affect from intellect in negation at the origin of judgment, and above all in what Hippolyte calls the myth of outer and inner, he writes of this one, that the text becomes entirely mythical, that there are two instincts which are, as it were, tangled together in this myth, which bears the subject one instinct of unification, the other of destruction, a grand myth, as you see, and one which repeats others. Freud's negation essay, it seems to me, is all of these things. It does offer these myths. It is structuralist, as Lacan claims, but I would add that it makes transcendental arguments that posit the no not just as a myth, but as a transcendental structure, above all, I want to suggest that this text is an ontological one. So while Lacan seems to agree with Hippolyte in identifying the mythos inherent in this text, Lacan also flirts with the possibility of finding an ontology here. He says, this creation of the symbol, as Hippolyte stressed, must be conceptualized as a mythical moment rather than as a genetic moment. One cannot even relate it to the constitution of the object, since it concerns the relation between the subject and being, and not between the subject and the world. Lacan develops Freud's claim that there is no no to be found in the unconscious in his uh, word playful proposition. He says, nothing exists except insofar as it does not exist. That is, the symbol of the nothing, the signifier, the word nothing, no thing, signifies in existence, except insofar as the nothing itself does not exist, which paradoxically would be the true existence of the nothing somehow. So, so, so the nothing, in either case, exists. I think we have to understand Freud's claim that there's no no to be found in the unconscious in the same register. The doctrine of negation depends upon it. Lacan's wordplay on nothing that nothing exists except insofar as it does not exist, brings us back to Carol's presentation, or to Carol's position on the nothing, that is to Alice's fantasy in which nothing is what it is because everything is what it isn't. We are now in a position to rethink this fantasy on the basis of the game of the nothing that Lacan introduces. What if we read, I suggest, the it here in nothing exists except in so far, oh no, that's, that's Lacan, sorry, in, in, um, in Alice's, nothing is what it is because everything is what it isn't. What if we read the it here according to the rule of this game in which this line would then read, nothing is what it is precisely so that everything can be what it, the nothing, isn't, namely so something or rather anything at all. But to say this is to repeat the epigraph with which I began from Heidegger's fundamental question of metaphysics. The Freudian metaphysics, I'll conclude, is also compelled by the nothing. It asks, likewise, why are there beings at all and why not, far rather, nothing? <laughs>